This morning, uh, I'm going to be talking to you about basically the story of climate change so far in a global sense, but also trying to relate this to what's happened in Ireland and what's likely to happen to the climate of Ireland in the future, and in particular what's going to happen to our, our weather and our weather extremes uh, in the future. So I'll be covering you know, what's happened in the global climate and Irish climate uh, to date, how we use uh, mathematical models to predict, uh, to project future climate, and how to move climate modelling from a global scale to a local scale, because it's at a local scale where we really, really need to know for Ireland what's likely to happen. We will then have a look at future climate projections uh, for Ireland, and finally we'll have a look at how these uh, uh, changes in the climate are going to impact on Ireland at a local scale. So uh, the global, uh, t t the global uh, temperature has been increasing since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution about the 1850s. And what we're looking at here is a spiral showing how the temperature of the globe has changed on a monthly basis since about 1850 up to the present day. Without going into too much detail, you can see as the spiral rises, at the present time, the, the, the cone is much, much wider, which explains, which indicates that the global temperatures have increased. And in particular, in the past couple of years, the, uh, we have witnessed the highest global temperatures on record. Um, so this is looking at it on an annual basis. It's a little bit better to see this, for example. You can see this, the trend is quite clear. There's been quite a steady increase in temperatures in the last 20 or 30 years on a global scale. And in particular, in the last couple of years, 2015 and 16, were the warmest years in the global record, going back at least until 1850. In an Irish context then, well, We've also experienced uh, rises in temperature since about 1900. This is a time series for Irish stations, five long-term stations from, about 90, from 1900 onwards. The signal here is a little bit noisier. So the solid line is a, the solid line, uh, is a five, uh, 11 year moving average. And you can generally see the trend more or less mirrors the, the global trend in, in temperatures. And if we draw a straight trend line through this graph, we can see that since uh, 1900, the Irish temperature has been increasing at 0.08 degrees uh, per decade. If we look at the rainfall trend, this is, a, an average, or this is a, a compilation of all of the rainfall records which we have from 1941. We can see on an, an annual basis, the rainfall for Ireland ranges between about 1,000 1, or 1,000 and 1,300 millimetres per year. There's also quite a lot of natural variation within this, but in the past, past couple of years we have seen some extremely wet years. And if we look again, going back for specific stations, this is a time series for 25 rainfall stations dating from 1850, we can see that in the, in the winters of 2014, 13, 14, and 15, 16, we had exceptionally wet winters, which were outliers in the temperature series going back to 1850. So clearly it looks like there's something happening with the rainfall, particularly during the winter seasons. We can also look at climate change indicators for Ireland. These are where we look at station data and we see what kind of trends we can extract from the data. We can see here, this is a trend of the number of frost days per decade. And the red essentially indicates that the number of days of frost at our stations where we observe temperatures have been decreasing since 1961 up until 2016. Likewise, if we look, for example, at extreme weather events, these are numbers that counts of numbers of days where we have rainfall greater than 10 millimetres in a day. And we can see that there are increasing trends in this of between two to four days per decade where there are more days with 10 millimetres of, of rain. Okay. So this is the backdrop to climate change. So what causes climate change? Well, the Earth's climate system operates, the Earth's climate system takes in energy from the sun and the Earth radiates that energy out as infrared radiation. So there's quite, quite a balance in this. Changes in the Earth's orbit over periods of time obviously change the radiation balance of the Earth. The planetary alignment, global plate tectonics, the current alignment of the continents has only been with us for about two to four million years. But before that, of course, the, the continents had different alignments and the oceans 
uh, covered different parts of the globe. So the climate was different at different times in the past. And as the Earth's ecosystem evolved over the past uh, 4 billion years, particularly from about 4 million years ago when uh, we had the Devonian period, which was called the greening of the Earth, this was the period when there was a lot of vegetation growth which laid down the, the fossils and the fossil fuels which we are burning today and especially since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So it's only since about two to four million years ago where we had the current continental alignment and the current ocean current circulation which more or less define our current uh, climate. Of course there are natural contributors to climate as well. For example, volcanic, uh, volcanic eruptions can cause uh, impurities into the atmosphere which can cause cooling temporarily in the global climate system. Over time too, there can be changes in the output from the sun. But finally then we come to the greenhouse gases. So these are the gases which uh, interfere with the, uh, the radiation balance in the sense that they absorb infrared radiation which the Earth emits to try and, which has a critical role in balancing the energy budget of the Earth. So if we increase gases into the atmosphere, which absorb infrared radiation emitted from the Earth, this can lead to a buildup of heat in the atmosphere, and this is what we call the greenhouse effect. So if we want to look at the Earth's climate, we want to look back and see how the climate has varied to try and get evidence, to try and figure out what's happening. So how do we find out about the past climate? Well, there are a number of ways using, uh, in which we can reconstruct the paleoclimate of the Earth. We can, for example, use ice cores. We can use uh, evidence from tree rings. We can use evidence from uh, sediments in lakes, from pollens. And from these data, dating back hundreds of thousands of years, we can build up a climate of the Earth back for one to two million years. So what we're looking at here is a reconstruction of the Earth's climate from for the past 800,000 years. On the bottom in red, we have the, uh, the global uh, temperature, and above that we have levels of carbon dioxide. In grey, we show periods where the Earth was going through a warm phase. And you can see in the blue the carbon. As we go through the warm periods in the Earth's past, the amount of carbon present in the Earth's atmosphere ranged between 180 and 280 parts per million. Now, if we go to the extreme right hand of the curve, we can see that at present times, we are now up to 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide. And this level of carbon dioxide has not been present in the Earth during any of the previous warm periods which we have experienced. So, if we look at... Uh, observed temperatures of the Earth for the period for which we have uh, instrumental record, this dates from about 1850 or 1860 onwards, we can see that in the past, towards the end of the 20th century, there was quite a steep rise in the global temperatures. If we look at that in the context of the past uh, thousand years, we can see that this temperature rise on the extreme right of the top uh, image here shows that the rate at which temperatures have increased at the end of the 20th century and the early years of the current century has been unprecedented in the past 1,000 years. We've also witnessed some changes in the Arctic sea ice extent. So we can see between the beginning of the 20th century and the present day there has been a significant decrease in the amount of Arctic sea ice present in September. And since the advent of satellites, of course, we can keep quite a good track of the amount of Arctic sea ice present. And we can see that, for example, in 2012, an absolute minimum was reached. And these uh, values of Arctic sea ice are monitored on a daily basis. And at present, we are close to the 2012 minimum for the time of, time of year. Now, the Arctic, of course, plays a crucial role in weather patterns and weather systems in the Northern Hemisphere. And the Arctic is also warming at a much, much faster rate than the rest of the planet. So changes in the Arctic are quite critical. And an example of this can be seen 
from an expedition which happened in the, 18, in the 1840s when Sir John Franklin set out to find a northwest passage through the Arctic. His ships became embedded in ice and were lost. At the time, it was quite a cause celebre, and there were many, many expeditions to find, try and find out what happened to this expedition. It was only in the past couple of years where the ships were finally discovered, 168 years after they disappeared. In the intervening time, and particularly in the last couple of years, a tourist industry has spawned in the Arctic. You might call this an adaptation to climate change. The local people, who the Inuits, who had been subsistence uh, Eskimos essentially, have now embraced climate change and there are now tours to visit the locations where Sir John Franklin's ships were discovered. So we have seen that the Earth's uh, climate is changing. The international response to this has been ongoing since the mid-1980s. And the UN established a body, the International Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to assess all of the information on climate change. It assesses all peer-reviewed publications on climate-related matters and produces assessments at a regular basis. To date, there have been five assessment reports published by the IPCC, the latest in 2013-14. They examine the science of climate change, past climate observations, they assess the output from climate models and also assess adaptation and mitigation strategies for the planet as a whole. Part of the international effort to tackle the issue of climate change has been the use of climate models to try and project changes in the global climate. These models have increased in sophistication since they began in the mid-1970s in the beginning, the models were quite crude. They included atmospheric, land and sea uh, processes. But in the current decade, the models, as I say, have become much more sophisticated and include aerosols, carbon cycles, vegetation, land ice and atmospheric chemistry. So the model is now quite sophisticated and increasing in skill all the time. The climate models also give an indication that anthropogenic or man-made influences are having an influence on the climate. To the right-hand side of this graph, we have our, uh, this image is a, a reconstruction of the climate using observational data and also model data. On the right-hand side of, of, of the image, we have on the top in pink, the projected climate change when man-made carbon emissions are included in the models. And on the bottom of the graph, on the right-hand side in blue, we have the, what the models predict would happen if anthropogenic or man-made carbon emissions were excluded from the models. You can only reconstruct the rise in temperatures at the end of the 20th century if man-made carbon emissions are included in the climate models. So how do these models then deal with projected uh, carbon emissions for the future? Well, you've already heard mention of the, carbon, uh, of the uh, Paris Agreement towards limiting carbon emissions. So the international community and the climate modelling community have agreed various ways in which the amount of carbon to be included in climate models can be assessed and links this to actions which can be taken globally to reduce carbon emissions, these are so-called climate scenarios. There are four main scenarios, one of which is business as usual, which is the red graph on the top here. And uh, in this uh, scenario, carbon emissions more or less continue unchecked. In this case, towards the end of the current century, we would see a rise in global temperatures up between three and five degrees Celsius. On the other hand, at the very bottom in blue, we can see that if drastic action is taken to reduce uh, carbon emissions, that the uh, global rise of temperature by the end of the century can be limited to between 1 and 2.5 degrees Celsius. And in between then we have so-called mid-range scenarios, which are probably the more likely to occur, and in these the temperature 
increase will range between 1.5 and about 3.5 degrees Celsius. So the global modelling community uses these scenarios to input data into climate models and to project what future, what future climate scenarios are likely. The most likely output is that by the end of the current uh, century, global temperatures will rise between 1.5 and 4.5 degrees Celsius, depending on how successful global action is taken to reduce carbon emissions. And this just sums it up here on the right-hand side. If we take RCP, is a, I am very conscious of what Mary Robbins said about jargon. It's representative concentration pathways, which is obviously scientific jargon. It basically means how much carbon in a particular scenario will be emitted. So we're looking at an uh, increase in temperature depending on the emission scenario up in 1.5 and 4.5 degrees Celsius. So this just an image just sums things up. As carbon emissions increase, on the top we see the global temperature increases. And the global temperature increases faster in the Arctic than in any other region of the planet. And this means that towards the end of the current century, we are looking at an ice-free Arctic by the end of the century for a high emission scenario. So this is the current situation as regards Arctic sea ice. And this is for a, a medium low emission scenario. So even if we are very, very successful at reducing carbon emissions over the coming decades, it still looks like the Arctic will be more or less sea ice by the end of the current century. And if we continue at business as usual, it's almost certain that the Arctic will be ice free by the end of the current century. One of the effects of this obviously will be all of this ice melting will give rise to a rise in, in global sea level. So there are two contributory factors to rises in sea level. One is the melting of ice caps and glaciers, and the other is the general rise in global temperatures. As the global temperatures rise, the temperature of the oceans will also rise. And as the temperature of the ocean rises, the water in the ocean expands. So the, the increase in sea level is contributed more or less equally by both of these processes, by thermal expansion due to the water heating up, and also by melting of the ice caps. And by the end of the current century, again, depending on the emission scenario, we are looking at a sea level rise of between 0.5 and 1 metre. So in summary, at a global scale, Temperatures have increased by about one degree from pre-industrial times. We're looking at another 1.5 to 4.5 degrees increase by the end of the current century. This will lead to, in, to changes in global weather patterns, increased desertification, changes in rainfall patterns, change in onset of monsoons in vulnerable parts of the world. Sea level rise is projected to continue at three millimetres uh, per year, or a rise of 0.5 to 1 metre by the end of the current century. And CO2 levels are continuing to rise and currently are above 400 parts per million. So and I just want to briefly touch on how we use climate models to project the future. There will be more talks later on this morning in more detail how, we, how these are used. People often ask, well, how can you model the future climate when you can't predict the weather for longer than 10 days in advance? Well, the answer to scientists is relatively straightforward. In terms of climate modelling, we're looking at periods of hundreds of years. And we're looking at the energy in a total, the total energy in a system. In that case, the initial conditions don't, ex don't matter too much because you have a large spin-up period to remove dependence on initial conditions. So you're looking at balance between the energy into the earth and the energy going out. Weather, on the other hand, is more interested in the day-to-day -day variation in the atmosphere. And for that, the initial conditions are extremely important. And it's because of difficulties in, 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 in describing initial conditions exactly that weather models have a limit of about 10 days in, in deterministic accuracy. That's what we call pinpoint accuracy. But of course, climate models produce averages, and we're interested in weather extremes in a future climate. 
So we actually apply climate models to get the, the averages in the future, and then we apply weather models in the future to the climate models to try and bring this information to a very local scale. And Ireland, through MedEarn, iCheck, the Irish Centre for High-End Computing and the EPA, are involved in a global climate modelling consortium called EC Earth. The countries involved in that are in uh, yellow, in that image on the right-hand side. So these climate models work by dividing the Earth up into, into a grid. The global models operate at a grid size of about 125 kilometres. And you can see here, this is in, uh, in that image there is of uh, the UK and Ireland. And you can see that at a grid size, uh, that's a, a box of 125 kilometres squared, you're not going to get very much local information out of a model at that resolution. So we apply methods called downscaling using weather models to bring this information to a local scale where we can have a look at climate extremes at a local level, which is what we're really interested in. So we look at a number of global models. We use, uh, in current work, we're using four global, global models. We're using three different weather models to downscale these. And then we're also using a number of different climate emission scenarios. So in total, we have over 20 uh, model outputs to examine the future climate of Ireland at a, local lay, at a local level, and these are called ensembles of climate prediction. And from these ensembles, then, we can look and we can derive information on climate extremes for Ireland in the future, or weather extremes for Ireland in the future, based on the output from the climate models. So if we're looking at changes in extremes, we can see that... Um, if the orange in this diagram is the current climate and the red is the new climate, if the temperature increases, this arrow here to the right, we get a new climate with more warm weather and less cold weather. And we can examine the output of climate models statistically to see how much chance there is of higher extremes and changes in extremes in a new climate. And of course, in the case of precipitation, we're only interested really in how much more heavy precipitation events there will be. And these are the results. These are results uh, obtained by my colleague Paul Nolan, who has done most of the work uh, in this area. In terms of the mean temperature for Ireland, it looks like we're going to have an increase in temperature of between 1 and 1.5 degrees Celsius in mean temperature on an annual basis. So that's this part of the curve here, an increase in mean temperature. If we look at, for example, the amount, the, how summer maximum temperatures are likely to increase, that's the top 5% of maximum temperatures uh, during the summer, we find that the temperatures will increase between 2 and 2.6 degrees Celsius, depending on whether we look at a low emission scenario or a high emission scenario. And that is this part of the curve here, where extremes are increasing at the high temperature end. If we look then at the um, minimum temperatures, these are the, the lowest uh, temperatures, the minimum temperature during winter, we find again for medium emissions and high emission scenarios, the minimum temperatures also increase, which is less cold weather or less cold extremes in a new climate, which perhaps isn't that surprising. Again, there's a, big, a pattern emerging here, obviously. We will also see less frost days. Again, that's a change at the lower end of the temperature distribution. And if we look at summing together numbers of days together where we have uh, higher mean temperatures, we see that we're going to look at getting an increase in the length of growing season at between 30 and 40 days per annum, where the, the growing season is defined as a minimum of six days in a row where the mean temperature is above five degrees Celsius. For changes in annual precipitation, we're looking at a decrease in overall precipitation average annually 
of, of up to 10%. And in the summer, it looks like there are significant decreases of between 10 and 20%, depending on whether it's a low or high emission scenario. There are also indications of changes in winter precipitation, particularly when it comes to heavy rainfall events. We're looking at an increase in the number of days with very heavy rainfall. That's rainfall over, 20 or 20, over 30 millimetres per day. And of course, changes in heavy precipitation, particularly in wintertime, will give rise to increased flooding events. But also, if you align this to decreases in summer precipitation, it means in summertime, more water stress and more droughts. So between the two together, we are looking at drier summers, more droughts, wetter winters with more extreme rainfall events, which will lead to more flooding events. And if we look then at the, what's likely to happen in terms of storm climatology, well, pardon? On the left-hand side here, we can see the number of, of uh, storms uh, during a 30-year period in the past climate. In the future climate, it looks like there will be less storms overall. But it, it appears from the evidence from the models that there will be increased severity in storms and an increased likelihood of a smaller number of more severe storms reaching Ireland. And this is a, a, an output from the EC Earth model for the last uh, decade of the current century. And it's looking at the incidence of hurricane force winds likely over the northwestern uh, Europe domain at the end of the century. And it, it shows essentially there's a slight increase in the, in the possibility of hurricane force winds uh, in northwestern Europe at the end of the, uh, in the 2090s. And of significant note in this uh, image here is, in the past climate, the 27 degree temperature isotherm in the North Atlantic is positioned here, whereas at the end of the century it's positioned here. And this means that there is more energy available in the sea to feed into more severe storms towards the end of the century. If, you, if we ally then the increase, the projected increase in global uh, uh, sea level rise to the increased severity of storms and coastal erosion, we find, of course, that a lot of our infrastructure in coastal areas is under threat from uh, increased storm surges coupled with rising sea level rise, and the Office of Public Works has completed quite a detailed study into the effects of rising sea level and increased uh, storm surge on coasts around Ireland. An example here is what is uh, likely to happen in the Wexford Harbour area in a changed climate. And finally, to wrap up on what We've looked at what the physical effects in terms of meteorology and climatology are on Irish climate. What actually does this mean in a real sense? What are the effects on nature? Well, it looks like we will have uh, a longer growing season, which is positive in many, many regards. But also there will be increased stress on animals and crops due to increased temperatures and a higher incidence of heat waves. We'll be looking at changes in the profile of plant and animal diseases, changes in the dynamics of pest species, an increased occurrence of invasive species, perhaps some species able to survive and adapt in Ireland that weren't able to do so before, and also changes in biodiversity and phenology. An example of this would be, for example, if in spring the temperatures rise earlier, this means, for example, that caterpillars might arrive, might hatch before leaves bud on trees, in which case they won't have much to eat. Migratory birds then, which arrive expecting when their chicks are hatched that there will be a plentiful supply of caterpillars might find that the caterpillars haven't survived. So many parts of what's going to happen in the future climate are interlinked and are not immediately obvious. So there are quite dramatic effects which could happen to our biodiversity in the future. So, to sum up the main points in terms of the, the meteorology of what's going to happen, the mean temperatures will increase by 1 to 1.5 degrees Celsius by mid-century. All the seasons will be warmer. We will see more hot days and less frosts. 
we will see increased growing season length, more heat waves and less cold spells. There will be a decrease in overall uh, rainfall. We will see drier summer and spring seasons and more frequent days with heavy rain in winter and autumn. There will be a slight decrease in overall storm activity but an increase in the number of severe storms. So these are the challenges ahead for Ireland and we must prepare for a changed climate where extreme events become more severe, infrastructure, particularly in coastal and low-lying areas, will become susceptible to erosion and storms and floods. And changes in temperature, of course, will bring some opportunities, but also some threats. So what is the role for Met Aaron in this? Well, our role is to ensure that society in Ireland is in a position to adapt to these changes. And we will do this through ensuring that we have observation systems to monitor the climate change and we operate the best weather prediction and climate models to ensure that the best scientific outputs are able, are able to produce high quality scientific data so that people can make informed decisions on how best to adapt to the changed climate. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Seamus, um, and you know, I think we'll all agree a really interesting presentation highlighting, you know, first of all, the global climate trends and projections, but really importantly, bringing them to a local level in Ireland and identifying potential impacts there. I think what also struck me is the importance of research because we need more and more information and evidence to support then the actions that are required in this area. Now, um, can I encourage people, first of all, to use the Slido with any questions, um, and also then, uh, there are, uh, I think, two roving mics, so if you have a particular question, maybe if you could um, shake your hand at one of the mics, and then uh, stand up, and uh, we, we'll get to you in a moment. Um, I'll start, start off with Slido, um, and... I suppose one that, that seems to, a question seems to have got a lot of likes, Seamus, so uh, we'll go with that, is, is it time for a stronger message from Met Aaron, acknowledging climate change explicitly in day-to-day -day communications? And I think this was something probably met, uh, Mary Robinson also highlighted. Well, I think um, the answer is yes, and we are asked this uh, quite frequently. And one of the things that I think people expect or have asked us to do is that one of the things we're quite frequently asked is, in, the, in, in weather bulletins, can we, we include uh, information on, on climate change? And I think we would like to do this, but there are certain constraints to do with uh, the weather forecast information, one of which is that the time for this is quite limited in terms of the bulletins. Uh, and there's also, in terms of providing information in a a one and a half or two minute bulletin on radio and TV, it's really got to do with the here and now. And uh, there's quite a lot of regional variations in our weather and we're trying to give outlooks for two to five days. So it's just an added thing to try and include in. And it must be included in, I think, in, in a way in which it's not forcing it at people and that has to be done in a kind of a scientific, in, uh, with scientific integrity, that not every piece of uh, weather which happens that's extreme is related to climate change. So yes, I think we do need to look at that and I think we certainly could do a better job. I'd like to think, for example, that today is one of perhaps the first step in kind of getting out there more and bringing uh, what we, we view as the important issues in climate change to the people. But, and yes, I do take the point that we should certainly be out there communicating the science behind climate change more if, when we can. I'm not sure how is the best way to integrate this. Perhaps maybe more dedicated slots on television or radio might be a better way to do it than uh, integrating it completely into day-to-day uh, -day weather forecasts. Okay. And the difference, again, between weather and climate that you were highlighting during your talk. Um, another question on the Slido was, um, could the slides be made available on the Met Aaron website? And I presume that's an easy one to, 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 to say yes, yes I, to, I, yes, she I, says. I think they are, and I, I think, in fact, we're, we're, I think we're going out live on YouTube, and I, I presume that, that the talks will be available even afterwards, but I'm not completely certain about that. Perfect. 
Um, now, just any questions from the audience there? And there's a microphone over here, please. Um, uh, thank you for a very informative uh, uh, speech. Um, one of your slides um, addressed, if we continue as business as, as usual with carbon dioxide emissions, by the end of the century, it's possible global temperatures will be uh, five Celsius warmer. Does that include uh, methane concentration increases as well? Yes, that includes, that includes all greenhouse gases. Oh, yes. Yes. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, maybe taking another one from Slido, and this will probably be our, our, our last question. Um, just because it relates specifically to Met Air, and I, the question is how will uh, the current Met Air and weather warning system be improved in terms of clarity and communication preparedness measures to the general public? Okay. Um, maybe you could. Yeah, just... um, okay. Well, the first thing is that I think we've done a lot of work in this in the past uh, few years. I think the the colour coding of the warning systems, which took place, I think, three or four years ago, has, has greatly enhanced uh, how the public perceived the weather warnings. It's much, much clearer to people now what the uh, yellow, orange and red alerts mean, or to me anyway, it's clear, but perhaps it's not, and, and we, we, I think, need to engage in outreach with, with people and take on board what people are saying as to whether or not these colour coding uh, uh, the, uh, applying colour codes to warning systems actually works with people. I thought, uh, I was of the opinion actually that, that, that they had quite well and that, that had been um, qu quite, a, quite a change in, in, in that. I think uh, in terms of communication, one, one thing which we are doing at the moment is we shortly will be launching a new website, an app, which will again help to promote and get our warnings out there uh, in, in, a, in a better and a more timely way. And we need to adapt also kind of to newer methods of communication like Twitter, social media, to make sure that the message actually gets out there to people who need it in, in as timely a, a manner um, as possible. So I think really that's what, what I would say about this is that we will obviously use the most up-to-date communications methods that we have. I think we probably will engage in some market research survey to see uh, on the social, social side, what action are people taking and what of our warnings and how we can actually uh, frame the warnings in a better way. If there's a better way of doing it, obviously we will look at a better way of doing it. So we need to actually get out there and talk to people and find out if the warnings aren't clear enough for people to take action because obviously from our point of view, we're, if we're issuing warnings, we, what we want people to, to uh, be able to understand what the warnings mean and perhaps again that's coming back to something which maybe Mary Robinson alluded to, uh, maybe less technical jargon. And I think maybe in the afternoon when we come on to the impacts of uh, moving the forecast from, uh, or particularly the warnings, to an impact based type warning system where it will be what the weather will do rather than what the weather will be. I think maybe when we move towards that over the coming years, that will increase, I think, the public take up of what we actually mean by our warnings. Okay. Thank you very much, Seamus. And uh, thank you for that presentation. I think it really set us up excellently for the day. Um, thank you.